All righty, gang, welcome back. We're going to have a slightly light class today because a, a good chunk of the class is taking the makeup version of the test, which is fine. Um, so I'm not expecting a full room, which means it's a slightly more intimate thing. It's just us, we're chilling. Um, and that's, that's kind of pleasant. We can have a little bit more of a dialogue here. Um, last time we introduced this thing called implicit differentiation, which is a powerful tool for calculating derivatives like y prime or dy dx, even if you don't have an explicit expression for y. So you can just differentiate through any expression, carefully using the chain rule everywhere we encounter a y, um, and then solve or not the resulting expression for y prime. So that was pretty fun. And we saw some of those can get quite hairy. They can get pretty nasty. Um, <clears throat> the calculus steps don't tend to be too bad, but the algebra steps can be quite intimidating, especially if your goal is to solve for y prime at the end. And then God forbid you want the second derivative or something like that. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying those problems in the homework. And if there's anything there that you do want to talk about more is giving you a rough time or you just find frustrating and you're curious if there's a better way to do it, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, office hours are a great way to do that. If you can't come to a regular office hour, you can always snap a photo with your phone, send that to me. I, um, I actually really enjoy receiving those. Those are always a little fun. Ooh, I get to do some math now. Um, things when those emails come in. Today, we are going to kind of extend those skills from last time. We saw how implicit differentiation allowed us to differentiate the inverse trig functions. That was a, a bit of a, a hassle to get through to those derivatives by you know, differentiating implicitly, solving for y prime, and then using some trigonometry. Um, today, we're going to do something similar to get the derivative of the natural log function. That's not something we have yet. We can differentiate lots and lots of stuff, but so far, we don't know how to differentiate just good old ln of x. So we're going to learn that. And then I'm going to show you um, a special secret for differentiating really big scary shit where you're like, oh my god, I need the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule, I need it all and it's going to be terrible. Um, there is a very clever workaround for differentiating stuff like that called logarithmic differentiation. So let's go ahead and get to it. This is MAC 2311 section number 004, which is a top one class and the date today is the 11th of November 2022. And today, the textbook calls this, um, what do they call it, derivatives of logarithms or something like that. Um, I call this just log derivatives in the syllabus. And it is section number, I think, 3.6, I could get off the top of my head. Yeah, 3.6. Um, I want to give you a heads up that uh, while I am working through your tests, I may not have them all done by Monday because I have so many people taking makeup exams that I've got something like eight or nine different versions of this test floating around out there right now. And boy, does that make it complicated. Um, but I'm going to do my best for those who took the test on Monday to have at least those tests graded on Monday. So if you took the test with the, the rest of the class on Monday, should be able to have those all sorted out by then. If you're taking it at a different time or if you're watching this because you're taking it right now and still finishing, that might be a little while longer. Um, just a heads up. Um, but yeah, log derivatives, derivatives of log functions. The game here is, again, implicit differentiation. And we're going to start by, um, by differentiating the natural log, as promised. Before I do that, though, I want to remind you some algebra properties of logarithms that are going to come in very handy down the road. So I know. In pre-calculus classes and college algebra classes, there's this allergy to the logarithm, right? They're, they're seen as these kind of scary things. I remember uh, when I was in um, 1147, reaching out to one of my friends. I was at a community college. He was at university. And I sent him all these problems that my, frankly, sadistic pre-calculus teacher gave me. And he asked, who is putting you through logarithm hell? And this guy was a senior electrical engineering major. And he just said, oh, God, this is awful. Um, I want to demystify the logarithm for you. I want to get to a place where you feel very comfortable and natural with it because it is truly a beautiful function. Um, so we're going to start by talking about exponent and log properties. And hopefully, these at least feel familiar. 
on the left over here, I'm going to put a property of exponents. And on the right, I'm going to put the corresponding property for logarithms. The reason I think it's nice to look at these together is because the logarithm, remember, is the inverse of the exponential. So every one of those weird algebra properties of a logarithm is actually just kind of an inverse property of an exponent. So the first one that comes to mind for me is if you take a to the x and you multiply by a to the y, you take a product of two powers where the bases are the same. Uh, one way to calculate that is by adding the powers, right? Because this is like a times a times a times a x times. This is like a times a times a times a y times. And if you write all of those next to each other, that's <clears throat> x copies of a next to y copies of a, which is x plus y copies of a. The corresponding logarithm property here, here's how I read this. Exponential functions take addition inside the function and turn it into multiplication outside the function, right? If you're thinking of like a to the x as a function, this expression over here, a to the x plus y, is addition going on inside the function. And this is multiplication going on outside the function. Logs are the inverses of exponentials, so they do precisely the opposite. If you have the base a log of x times y, multiplication going on inside the function, that's the same thing as addition going on outside the function. So that's the base a log of x plus the base a log of y. They really say the same thing. It's just alternate notation. The corresponding rule for division in terms of exponents is a to the x over a to the y is equal to a to the x minus y. If you're going to divide two powers with the same base, you can just subtract those powers. So what this says is that the exponential takes subtraction inside and turns it into division outside. And if you kind of invert that property, you get the statement about logarithms, I would say that division inside the logarithm is the same as subtraction outside the logarithm. And then the third major one here is that if you have a, a power like a to the x and you want to raise that all to the y power, so this is like a power outside the exponential. That's the same as a to the x time y, multiplication inside the function. So exponentials take multiplication inside to powers outside. So what does the logarithm do? Well, that should then take powers inside and turn them into multiplication outside, and indeed it does. So there's nothing mystical about these log properties. If you're comfortable with the things on the left, then you're secretly comfortable with the things on the right, even if you've never seen them before. In particular, for the, the second part of class today, when we talk about that trick for differentiating big nasty things where it's like, oh shit, I'm going to use product portion chain rule, all of it, and these properties, are going to be the things that save the day. These will allow us to expand big expressions and then differentiate each one of them on their own because they take these kind of unpleasant operations like multiplication, division, and powers and turn them into these easier operations like addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Uh, the catch is, of course, if you're going to differentiate something like this by differentiating its equivalent expression here, you've got to know how to differentiate the log. So we're going to start with the derivative of the natural log, and then we're going to use that to conjure the derivative of the base a logarithm in general. That would be the game. All right. I would keep these somewhere nice and safe in your notes so you can refer back to them. Just like rules for semicolons and commas go somewhere important in your English book, these go somewhere important in your math book. The first thing we want to do today is find f prime of x 
where f of x is the natural log function. And the trick to doing this is going to be very much the same as the trick for differentiating the um, inverse trig functions. And what works for inverse trig works for logarithms because they're both functions that are defined to be the inverse of some other function, right? Like the inverse tangent is defined to be the inverse of the tangent function. Well, when we define the logarithm in pre-calculus in college algebra, we start with e to the x. We talk about how it's one to one, therefore has an inverse. And we go, oh shit, I don't know. There's like no algebra property that will allow me to solve, you know, y equals e to the x for x. So we invent one and we call it the logarithm. We say, this is what does the job. So this is the inverse of e to the x. So mimicking what we did with the inverse trig functions, we're going to begin by writing y equals ln of x. And observe that we want y prime, because that is f prime of x. Okay. That, that would be the thing I want, which is d dx of the natural log. And just like with the inverse trig functions, there's an equivalent expression. Y equals ln x means e to the y is equal to x. And I can differentiate e to the y equals x implicitly with respect to x. So I apply the operator ddx to both sides of the statement e to the y equals x. On the right-hand side, I just get 1. On the left-hand side, I'm differentiating with respect to x. And remember, we're thinking of y as f of x. So this is an implicit differentiation or chain rule thing. The derivative of e to the y would be e to the y times y prime y is a function, not just a variable. And remember, the thing I want here is y prime. y prime is f prime is the derivative of the natural log. So I'm just going to solve for y prime by dividing both sides by e to the y. And I get y prime is 1 over e to the y. But just like with the trig stuff, we don't want to leave this derivative in terms of y. The original function is a function of x, and I'd like to get my derivative as a function of x. So 1 over e to the y, how do I write that in terms of x? Well, e to the y is x. So 1 over e to the y, yeah, that's I made that same face. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, shit, that's so clever. Love it. It's great. 1 over e to the y is 1 over x. And that means that the derivative of the natural logarithm function is 1 over x. Bdx of the natural log of x is 1 over x. And this is one of our new derivatives that we just need to remember. Now you could cook it up like this if you forget, but it's one of those things we're going to use so much that you don't want to forget. You want to keep it nice and nice and straight in the head. A few pretty natural questions from this point. Well, what about a more general differentiation formula, like with the u's and u primes? One of those surely exists, and yes, it does. Um, also, what about other base logarithms, right? The natural log isn't the only log. I mean, in some sense, it's the only log we care about, but there are other base logarithms. Do they have different derivatives? Uh, and we'll see, uh, yes, to an extent. 
before I move away from this, any questions about these uh, first few things, the blue stuff at the top or this procedure for finding the derivative of ln x? Okay. So we'll attack those other things. Uh, in the order I mentioned them. More general. Differentiation. Formula for the logarithm would be um, in the prime notation, if you're going to differentiate the natural log of u, where u is understood to be a function of x. When you take that thing and prime it, then the result is going to be just straight chain rule stuff. You know, the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x, so the derivative of the natural log of u would be 1 over u. But then by the chain rule, you're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So it's 1 over u times u primed. And you'll find a lot of people writing this as the single fraction u primed over u. I think that's a nice way to remember it. I like it like that. <clears throat> and then what about other bases? Like what is dx of the base a logarithm of x. Well, there's this thing for logs called the change of base formula. Uh, that says that if you take a logarithm base a, of some stuff, I'll call it x, and you want to rewrite this in terms of some other base, say b, this is the base b log of the inside divided by the base b log of the old base. This is the, the full change of base rule. And since I know how to differentiate the natural log, it makes sense to convert this base A log into a natural log through this formula and then differentiate that. And my change of base rule says that the base A log of X could be written as the base B log of X divided by the base B log of A, where B is any positive number, any number you choose. Apologize for my left handedness covering up as we write. What I'm going to do is inside here, I'm just going to change this into a natural log using this rule. I'm going to use b equals e. And this will become the ln of x over the ln of b. So if you use the base e here, then this is the log base e of x, which is the ln of x. And this is the log base e of a, which is, uh, uh, oh, I was using an a here. I'm so sorry, this is an a. And then this ln of a factor downstairs, I can think of that as 1 over the ln of a times the ln of x. I'm just straight algebra. And this piece, although it might not look like it, is a constant. a was the base of the logarithm we started with. It was just a number. It didn't depend on x at all. 
And we know constant multiples can pop out of derivatives. This is one over the natural log of A times ddx of the natural log of x. And that piece, ddx of ln x, is the thing that we just cooked up on the previous page. It's 1 over x. This is 1 over the natural log of a times 1 over x. And you'll often see people writing this as the single fraction 1 over x times the natural log of a like that. So if you want to know the derivative of the base 2 logarithm of x, or the base 5 logarithm of x, or for some sadistic reason, the base pi logarithm of x, you can do it. It's not just 1 over x. It's 1 over x times the natural log of the base. And we can look at a quick example or two. Any questions here before we get to concrete examples? Um, can you repeat the second step, the DDX of uh, down that one below? It. Yeah. Ah, so here I'm just using a, a sneaky algebra trick. So the ln of x divided by the ln of a, um, the sort of algebra rule there is that if you have a over b in general, any sort of fraction, I can think of this as 1 over b times a over 1. Is that good. just because you wanted to get the 1 over ln of a, like the ddx of 1 over ln of a is just 1 of ln over a? Um, not quite, no. So here, the ln of a, 1 over the, uh, let me run a little slower. a is a constant, right? It's just a number, which means that the natural log of a is just a constant, just a number. So the reason I'm, I'm doing this trick here in these three lines is because I don't want to do any sort of quotient rule thing here. I want to just get to differentiating the part that actually depends on x. So because this piece downstairs is a constant, I rewrite it like this. And then that fraction, 1 over ln a, is a constant. So he can pop out. And that leaves me just with this piece, which I learned how to differentiate in a little bit. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, this sometimes these like super stupid looking algebra tricks are the most useful thing in the world. It's it's kind of silly, but it works and it, it can really save us a lot of effort. So we wanted to try a concrete example. Um, let's find the equation of the tangent line. To the curve y equals x over the natural log of x at x equals, say, 100. Uh, this function x over ln x is very special. Uh, you guys know what prime numbers are, right? It's a number divisible only by itself in one number that can't be factored. If you ever want to know how many primes there are less than a given number, like how many primes are there less than 1 million? Land, this thing. It's called the prime number theorem. And it's not exact. It's an asymptotic approximation. But if you count the number of primes less than a million, and then you plug 1 million into this function, you'll find that they're extremely close. Um, and the bigger the number, the more accurate they are. So this can be thought of finding the equation of the tangent line, or even just the slope of the tangent line, can be thought of as thinking about how quickly you add new primes as you go further and further out. It's like, how many new primes do you get uh, around x equals 100? How quickly are the number of primes being added? So it's a fun little problem. Um, but we're just thinking of it as a tangent line thing, so let's do it. We need a point in the slope. Uh, we know x is 100, so we need to plug 100 in here.
And there's really not much that can be done to simplify this. 100 is 10 squared, so you could write this as 100 over, over uh, 2 times the natural log of 10. And cancel if you want. I'll just leave it like this. Uh, but x value obviously is this. So the slope is the fun part. Uh, here I will use the quotient rule because there's not anything I can do to simplify that ratio. And we don't really save anything by um, using the product and chain rules on this. So y prime here would be the bottom times the derivative of the top. And I'll still write this out like that, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, all divided by the square of the bottom. There's a nice notation for the square of the logarithm, just like with trig functions. You can write log squared instead of like ln of x all squared. I'm kind of fine with that. And then we'll clean up these primes. So x primed is 1. ln of x primed is 1 over x. This is the natural log of x minus x times 1 over x is 1. And we're dividing by log squared. And if I evaluate this at x equals 100, we get our slope as the natural log of 100 minus 1, all divided by log squared of 100. Therefore, this tangent line y minus the y value here equal m, which is the natural log of 100 minus 1 the square of 100 times x minus the x value of x. Kind of a funny looking one. Of course, all these things are just numbers, but because of the logarithm, it's hard to write them in a nice way. There is some simplification we could do in each of these cases, but nothing that, that I would argue is even worth doing. But what is worth doing, I think, just taking a look at the graph. So I'll hold here for a minute, and then we'll talk over the business. <laughs> Going to Desmos. Here's our guy. And kind of an interesting looking function, right? A little bit weird in the graph shape. Uh, this does, again, measure the number of primes less than or equal to x. So if you want to know about how many primes are there less than or equal to 25, about 7. So we may, I guess, closer to 8 if we're rounding, right? And you can count, see how many primes there are less than 25. We wanted to work way out at x equals 100. Maybe about here. Let me play with these. That's okay. So we had our point was 100, comma, uh, 100 over the natural log of 100. Right there. And our tangent line we planned was y minus 100 over the natural log of 100. Which is 
on from 100 minus 1 divided by um, 100. I don't think this will take the log squared notation, so I'll treat it like that. Times up times 100. And there it is. <clears throat> that is a solid tangent line. <clears throat> and notice how close the tangent line stays to this curve, and not just nearby the point, but actually quite far away, right? Uh, that's going to be a feature that is important when we get to this thing called linear approximation, how close the tangent line stays to the graph of the function. This is pretty rare. You don't see behavior this good that often. But yeah. So we can do all the things that we do with other derivative problems now. It's you know, just involving the natural law, nothing too crazy. We can try one more little example with the dynamic of different base. Uh, the only other base logarithm people really use, they talk about the base 10 log from time to time in college algebra and pre-calculus because there was an era when slide rules were the thing that base 10 logs had some meaning. But nowadays, the binary log, the base 2 log, is really the only one anybody else ever uses. Um, so let's do something fun here. Let's say. Suppose g of x is the base 2 log of f of x. Suppose that f of 10 is 16. And f prime of 10 is 9. And let's find g prime of 10. That's a little bit of a second step, so 16. So the trick here is going to be to employ a bit of chain rule together with our formula for the derivative of the base a log in general here, where a is 2 and see what we get. By the chain rule, g prime of x would be, well, I get when I differentiate the base 2 log of something is 1 over that thing times the natural log of 2 and then multiply by f prime, the derivative of the inside. So if this was just the base 2 log of x that I was differentiating, I'd get 1 over x times the natural log of 2. But since my inner function here is not just x, it's f of x, I have to use the chain rule. I get 1 over that inside times the natural log of 2 times the derivative of the inside. <coughs> So we said that f of 10 is 16 and f prime of 10 is 5. Let's see what we get now. If I plug in 10, because that's what I want, I want g prime of 10, and I have here g prime of x. So g prime of 10 is what I get by plugging 10 in for x. That's 1 over f of 10 times the natural log of 2 times f prime of 10. f of 10 is 16. This is 1 over 16 times the natural log of 2 times f prime of 10 that's 5. Uh, there are no common factors that cancel here or anything like that. You could write it as 5 over 16 um, and 2 if you want. But that's, that's really all we could ask to do here.
questions on this? Nothing too crazy, right? <clears throat> Let's get to the good stuff. The good stuff is called logarithmic differentiation. So imagine some deeply unkind math teacher presents you on an exam the following problem. Let's make this the fifth power downstairs. We can have like a square root of x and a cosine. If I had to generate a list of things I don't want to do with my time, differentiating this with the quotient rule would be on that list. It would be awful. The top and bottom each involve like product chain rule stuff. And to do all of that inside the quotient rule, no, no, no. The workaround, and this is quite clever, is to not differentiate this function, but to differentiate the natural log of this function. Because what did we say at the start? The natural log takes division inside to subtraction outside, multiplication inside to addition outside, powers inside to constant multiples outside. All the stuff that makes differentiating this shitty goes away if you take the log and expand it out. Remember those college algebra problems? Expand the logarithm expression as far as possible. This is why we did those. So the, the clever idea I had that Drake meme would be like quotient rule. No. This one, yeah. Take the ln of both sides. Expand then differentiate implicitly. And at the end, we'll solve for y prime. Right? Because differentiating this barehanded portion product chain rule is terrible. It's really just the worst. But if I take the natural log on both sides, then the scary stuff over here can be made less scary by expanding out that log. And then in the worst case, you just have to differentiate some, some pretty simple log expressions. And just a little bit of chain rule. That's all it'll be left. So we're going to use those blue rules to start expanding out that right-hand side. First of all, um, what I would use here is this division inside can be made into subtraction outside. So I'm writing some of the natural log of the top. Minus the natural log of the bottom. That's the second log property. And now each of these terms has some multiplication inside. So I can use the first log property to split those up. The only catch, you gotta be careful of this 
thing is negative, this term is negative. And when you expand that out, you need to make sure the negative gets to both of those pieces. We'll have the natural log of x plus 1 squared plus the natural log of x cubed minus 27 to the fifth minus the natural log of the square root of x. And this is the part where people mess up minus here. Actually, let me write it like this. So what I'm doing here in this step, specifically with the second piece, is I'm expanding this guy as log of this plus log of this. But I put it in brackets to remind myself that this negative right here needs to go to both terms. The way I think of it, those two terms were downstairs inside the original log. So in the expanded form, they both need to be negative. Kind of a quick mental check. If I'm going to replace this with a sum of two parts, that negative needs to distribute to both of those. I'll go ahead and distribute that negative in the next step. I'm also going to do something um, with that third property of the log, where a logarithm with a power inside, the power can come down in front. So this first piece, let me just have a little more space here, is going to be 2 times the natural log of x plus 1. And the five here will come down. So this will be five times the natural log of x cubed minus 27. Distributing the negative and remembering that square root x is x to the 1 half, pull that power down to be minus 1 half natural log of x. And distributing the negative, this will be minus the natural log of Oh. So ask yourself, would you rather differentiate this, which we started with, big scary fraction, chain rule, product rule, quotient rule, or this? A bunch of individual little terms, all just a tiny bit of chain rule. No chain rule even needed here. I know what I would do. And just remember that the left hand side is still the natural log of y, not y itself. Right, questions up to here? We'll come through with the algebra steps. OK, then. I'm going to differentiate on both sides implicitly with respect to x. The only place I actually have to use implicit differentiation is on the left. When I differentiate the ln of y, that's going to be y prime over y, or 1 over y times y prime. Either way you want to write it is fine. On the right-hand side, it's just chain rule stuff. This is going to be 2 times the outer function is ln of whatever. The inner function is x plus 1. So it's going to be the derivative of the inside. I'll write it like that. x plus 1 prime over x plus 1. <clears throat> the next term I have plus 5 prime. Again, u primed over u. So x cubed minus 27 prime over x cubed minus minus one half times, no chain rule here, just one over x. And then this last one is fun, minus cos of x times over cos of x. So I have y prime over y equals, <clears throat> and I'm just going to calculate all the primes. 
two times the derivative of x plus one is just one, so it's a one over x plus one plus five times. The derivative of x cubed minus 27 is 3x squared. So I have 3x squared over x cubed minus 27. Nothing to do in this next piece, just minus 1 over 2x. I'll simplify it a little bit like that. The last one here is my favorite. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So this is minus negative sine over cosine. The tangent function. Now we wanted y prime. I have y primed over y. So I need to solve for y prime. I could get an implicit expression like y prime equals y times all this stuff. Two over x plus one plus 15 x squared over x cubed minus 27 times one over two x plus the tangent of x. Um, or I could plug back in for y, get an explicit expression, y prime equals y itself as x plus 1 squared times x cubed minus 27 to the 2 divided by 1 of cos x. And this is still multiplying the big bracket expression from above. 2 over x plus 1 plus x squared over x cubed minus 27 minus 1 over 2x plus 2x. It's not zero work, but it's a lot less work than diving into the quotient, product, and chain rules for the thing. And what's better is that each individual step is very simple, right? The algebra expanding the log, that's something we do give college algebra students and we drill pretty hard on it in pre calc. Uh, there's no calculus there, so it's just algebra. The differentiation steps, straightforward. Straightforward little bits of chain rule. It's gotta know how to differentiate the natural log. Anything else? Just rearranging. Questions on any of these steps? And you might be thinking this doesn't look like the output from the quotient rule, right? This doesn't look like what you would get if you applied the quotient rule to the original thing on its own without the log, uh, but it is. If you, if you take the time to have a common denominator between all of these pieces, you will see that the thing you get is exactly the same as what you'd get if you applied the quotient rule. I wouldn't do that. I mean, it's not worth your time to go through that algebra, but you could, and you would find that, that you get the same thing. The procedure we ran through here is called logarithmic differentiation. That's the name for, for what you did, where you take the natural log on both sides, expand out, and then differentiate. <clears throat> that is called logarithmic differentiation. And this expression, y prime over y, is generally referred to as the logarithmic derivative of y. And there are a lot of places in um, analytic number theory in particular where logarithmic differentiation and the logarithmic derivative are more useful than the regular derivative. Uh, this is kind of a relative growth rate, right? Like y prime on its own, that's the rate of change for y. It's the growth rate for y. Uh, relative growth rate, you're taking the rate of change and dividing by the thing itself, right? Just like relative value. So if you're trying to, again, thinking about like 
prime numbers measure a density of something, then, then this is a, a nice way to do it for a change in density. The function with which we began would be unpleasant to differentiate the normal way, but possible to differentiate the normal way. There are a lot of functions that are impossible to differentiate the normal way, or at least no derivative rule we've seen so far applies. Well, we've seen all the derivative rules. We know how to differentiate powers of x. We know how to differentiate exponents, where the, the power is the variable, trig functions, ratios, composite, all of it, right? But there are a lot of functions that don't fit into any of those families. Um, and they're not functions you encounter a lot, especially in algebra classes. I think probably you never see them, um, but they're out there. One of my favorites is x to the x. If you look at this for a minute, you go, oh, um, okay, so there's an x in the base and there's a power. So maybe I can use the power rule, but oh, power rule requires that that power is a constant and this power is not a constant. So you go, okay, well, there's a variable in the exponent, so it's an exponential. Yeah, but exponentials have to have a constant base. It's not an exponential. So it's not a power rule thing and it's not an exponential thing. What the fuck is this? Uh, I'm not, I, I call these super exponentials, but I'm not sure if that's a, a generally acknowledged term. That's just the term I've come up with for them. But I can show you the graph. Uh, there's some weirdness going on over here. You can see Desmos having a bad day. <laughs> these, these little dots. Uh, that's because if you start plugging in negative numbers to this function, very strange stuff happens, uh, like negative one. Okay, well, that's negative one to the negative first power. That's one over negative one. That one's fine. And if you if you poke around in here, you will find a dot somewhere on here. It's, it'll struggle, but if I can get those guys to show back up, there is one there. But what happens if I plug in negative one half? Well, then you're taking negative one half and raising it to the power of negative one half. That's one over the square root of negative one half, which is root two over two times i. It's not a real number. Um, and God forbid you plug in something like negative pi. So there's a good reason why you won't see any portion of the graph over there. And let me try to give you a feel for how quickly this thing grows by changing the coordinates back. Um, this function goes really fast. Like it starts off going slow. It actually decreases for a little bit, turns around and then explodes up. If you compare it to something like e to the x, e to the x appears to win at first, but this thing very quickly takes over and destroys e to the x. And we usually think of e to the x as being a pretty fast growing function but he gets absolutely trumped. Just take your favorite x value, like three, and compare the two. I'll call this g of x with another way to compare them. Uh, f of three, g of three, right? Super exponential beats him by quite a bit. And if you use a larger x value, like 30, they're off by 11, no, sorry, 31 orders of magnitude. So this is billions and billions and billions of times bigger than this. This function at the input 30 is billions and billions and billions of times larger than this guy at 30. So x to the x, incredibly fast growing function. Let's find its derivative, right? The derivative tells you exactly how fast the function is growing. Let's see what we get. It's not been said here, but we need logarithmic differentiation, right? It's not a regular exponential because the base is variable. It's not a powerful thing because the power is variable. 
the only way to do this is the logarithmic differentiation. We're going to take the natural log on both sides. We're going to clean it up as much as we can using properties of log, differentiate implicitly, and then solve for f prime. And any function where both the base and the exponent are variable, you will need logarithmic differentiation. It's not optional, it's necessary. <clears throat> On the right hand side, one of our properties for logarithms is that a log of a power, that power can come down in the front. So this is x times the So now if I differentiate implicitly on both sides, the left-hand side becomes f prime over f. Oops, u prime over u anytime you go along. And the right-hand side requires a product rule. This would be x prime times the natural log of x plus x times the natural log of x. Good so far. All right. Uh, just filling in the pieces from the product rule there, we get on the left still f prime over f. On the right, x prime is one. That's the natural log of x plus x times one over x is one. Because this piece is one, and this piece is one over x, and x times one over x that cancels to one. Can you repeat what you just said there? Oh, sure. Um, so to arrive at this, I'm just calculating each of these little derivatives from the product rule. The derivative of x is just one, so this is maybe I'm doing too much of this. I'm sorry. This is um, one times the natural log of x plus x times one over x. And then here I can cancel these x's, right? Like two times one half or five times one fifth, those will just cancel to one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. No, I'm sorry. No, this is f prime of x over f of x equals the natural log of x plus one. And now finally, I guess almost finally, we can multiply both sides by f. Like so. And if I'm okay with an implicit expression, we could stop here, but there's no reason to stop there. I can get an explicit expression, f of x itself is x to the x. So this is x to the x times the natural log of x plus one. And that's job done. And you may have noticed that when we looked at the graph of x to the x, there was a horizontal tangent line, right? The graph kind of, it went, I think my video is mirrored. So it went down at first and then curved around and shut up. If you wanted to find the location of that horizontal tangent line, 
you would set this apparatus equal to zero. This piece is a bit of a mystery, and I'll, I, there's not much I can tell you about it right now, but soon we'll have a tool called Loki Palsville, which will allow us to investigate this thing near zero. But looking at the graph, so I'm going to here and turn off e to the x. Looking at the graph, you can see that, that the red curve never touches the x-axis, right? So x to the x is never zero. If I wanted to find the location of this horizontal tangent, it looks like somewhere right around here. The way I would do that is by setting the natural log of x plus one equal to zero. Let's go ahead and do it. We'll make it a second little example because we've, we've hooked up this derivative. Let's do something with it. Let's say find the x value. Where f of x equals f to the x has horizontal tangents. We just showed that f prime is this thing. What we need to do here is we need solve f prime of x equals zero. So that means we're looking for places where x to the x times the natural log of x plus one is equal to zero. And while this is not a polynomial equation, it does have a shared feature with the, the thing we used to solve a polynomial. I've got a product of two factors equals zero, right? This is like a factor, and this is like a factor. So I can set each of them equal to zero on their own. This will be true if x to the x is zero, or if the natural log of x plus one is equal to zero. And from the graph, we saw that x to the x is never zero. Right? Just like e to the x is never zero, it's not. There's no number you can plug in in the world that will make this zero. The only reasonable candidate would be zero itself. Um, but this function is undefined at zero. Zero to the zero is a weird thing, right? I don't know if you ever encountered this. It's one of those like Facebook math things that we see from time to time. Anything to the zero power is supposed to be one, but zero raised to any power is supposed to be zero. So what is zero to the zero? Is it zero because the base is zero? Or is it one because the exponent is zero? The answer is that the exponent wins, it's one. But it really depends on what flavor of zero to the zero you're looking at. In this case, um, x to the x tends to zero, or sorry, tends to one as x tends to zero. I'll show you the tool for that um, next time when we talk about what we call for. But yep, shot. It's too much. But this guy doesn't happen. Uh, this guy we can solve. This is the same as saying that the natural log of x is negative one. How do you solve that equation? Who remembers logarithmic equations? Is it e to the negative one? Yeah. Yeah, we can exponentiate on both sides using the base e. So the way you solve an equation in terms of uh, involving a logarithm is to isolate the log and then shove both sides in the exponent of e. It's like the opposite operation of taking the logarithm, you exponentiate. On the left-hand side, e raised to the power of ln x is just x. And on the right-hand side, you get e to the negative 1 or 1 over e. So this is our guy.
the y value at that point is kind of funny looking too. It's one over e raised to the one over e. This number. Kind of wonky, right? But there he is. That's a horizontal tangent location. So this function x to the x pretty crazy, super exponential, grows very, very, very fast. The only thing that even comes close, let's see if we'll do it. No. Do this. Yeah. The only thing that really comes close is the green function here. Uh, which is called the gamma function. It's actually, this is a translate of the gamma function. Oh, did I do that? Oh, it's plus one. Yeah, only thing that comes close. And these guys, you'll see, they actually grow at similar speeds, similar speeds. The green is off from the red by a, an exponential factor. Um, in fact, there's something called Sterling's formula, if you've ever heard of that. Um, if you've taken a statistics class or probability, anywhere you've had to do um, funny counting problems, like how many ways can you, you know, get a full house with a three decks of cards, that sort of thing. Um, this factorial is an important function in that sort of setting. Uh, if you've seen the binomial coefficient, like n choose k, six choose two, um, it's a hard function to work with because its normal definition only makes sense for positive whole numbers. But the function that kind of interpolates it is called the gamma function. And kind of the place where x to the x shows up as being special is if you're trying to find an analytic representation um, for the factorial. Uh, yeah. Um, that's about all I had planned for you guys today. We could look at some more logarithmic differentiation using stuff like this. Um, but I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. How do you guys feel? Do you want more practice with this stuff? Okay. <laughs> Let's do one or two more then. Um, what else is fun? So we saw that if you differentiate the natural log with cosine, you get the tangent function. That's neat. Um, Let's, let's keep it in the spirit that we're doing right now. Let's find y prime, where y is maybe x raised to the tangent of x power. This is another sort of weird super exponential thing. <clears throat> Because, as in the last problem, both your base and your exponent are variable, there is no regular differentiation rule that applies. You can't use the power rule because that's not a constant, and you can't use the exponential stuff because the base isn't constant. So, differentiate logarithmically. We can bring down the tangent of x. And we're left with tangent x times the natural log of x. And now differentiating implicitly on both sides with respect to x, we get y prime over y equals the derivative of this stuff, which is a product rule thing. That would be the derivative of tangent times the natural log plus tangent times the derivative of the natural log. And on the right hand side, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. We get secant squared times ln x plus tangent x times the derivative of the natural log is one over x. Um, 
thing after y. Uh, so that means that y prime is all of this stuff times y. And if I want an explicit formula, I would plug in for y. So that would be x raised to the tangent of x times sequence squared x natural log x plus tangent x times 1 over x. Mm. So one other thing that's kind of fits in here, I won't retell my drowning analytic number theory's joke. Um, Let's do this. And that terrible log log, log 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 joke. Let's find the slope of the tangent line to f of x equals ln of ln of ln of x at the x value e to the e. So e to the e is going to be somewhere just south of 27, right? Because e is somewhere just south of 3, and 3 cubed is 27. It's just a number. Uh, but this derivative, we want to calculate, this is going to be a fair amount of chain rule stuff because we've got three layers of logarithms to differentiate through. F prime. Uh, like an onion, we peel one layer at a time. So I differentiate this outer function, leaving this inner function alone. And then I multiply by the derivative of this inner function. That's going to be one over the inner function, which is ln of ln of x times the derivative of ln of ln of x. And then that leftover derivative there requires layers of chain rule work. This is one over the ln of the ln of x times. Here now, this is my outer and this is my inner. So I'll have one over the ln of x times the derivative of ln of x. And then finally, the derivative of ln x is just 1 over x. So this is 1 of log log times 1 over log times 1 over Silly stuff. Zoom out a little bit. Questions on either of these last couple of weeks? That's about as much as we can do. Okay, so this has been uh, derivatives of the natural log and logarithmic differentiation. Logarithmic differentiation is a fun tool. Look for excuses to use it, right? If somebody gives you a big scary product or quotient to differentiate, instead of using the quotient rule, do this stuff. It works so much better.
Um, even if it's not this terrifying of a quotient, even if, if you just had like this on its own or this on its own, I would differentiate that logarithmically. I, I wouldn't bother with the quotient rule in those settings. I would take the logarithm, expand everything out as much as I can, and then <clears throat> differentiate implicitly on both sides like we did here. But that is it for us today. We are out of time. Um, again, if you took the test on Monday of this week, I'll do my best to have it graded and all sorted out for you by Monday of next week. That's my general rule. I always try to get these done in one week. If you just took the test today, um, then I'll try to have it for you by next Friday. But because there's very little time for me to do that sort of stuff in the middle of the week, you may have to wait a bit longer. Um, but if you're panicking or nervous, if something is bothering you about your grade and you just need to know, need to know right now, go ahead and reach out to me and I'll see if I can move something from one stack to another for you. Uh, otherwise, I hope you guys have a lovely weekend. Please work hard on that homework set, which is up. If you missed the first part of this lecture um, because you were taking the makeup test, that's fine. I'm going to upload it to YouTube immediately. So just go ahead over there and watch it. Take notes as you would normally. If you have questions, come visit me in office hours and you can this message, hop on the Discord. You know the drill. Um, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Take care.